Good afternoon, everyone. Uh, for those who don't know, my name is Stephen Kelly. I'm Chief Executive of Manufacturing Northern Ireland. You're very welcome along this afternoon to our second session on the Trader Support Scheme. Trader Support Service, apologies. Uh, this is a follow-up to the session we held roughly about a month ago, and it's bringing us the latest information. And in fact, a brand new hot off the press presentation from our colleagues from the Trader Support Service. Uh, so you're getting first sight of the newest uh, version of the service and some actions that you should take as businesses to prepare for the end of the Brexit transition period come the 1st of January 2021. Uh, just to remind you all, the session is recorded and there is an opportunity for you to ask questions. So use the Q&A function in the uh, Zoom webinar and we'll make sure that we try to get answers for those questions as we go through the presentation. And just like we did before, uh, those that we can't immediately answer, we'll go back and we'll get some of the uh, questions answered for you and share those by email, perhaps in uh, a day or two's time. The session's recorded, so uh, both the slides and the recording will be emailed out to everyone uh, who registered for the event uh, in the next day or so. And I'd like to welcome this afternoon, Frank Dunsmere from uh, the Trader Support Service and Shankar Singham from the Trader Support Service, who'll take us through uh, their presentation. Just as a reminder, as part of the withdrawal agreement between the UK and the EU last year, uh, alongside that was the Northern Ireland Protocol and the actions from the Northern Ireland Protocol will mean that there are checks and controls uh, between ports in Great Britain and in Northern Ireland. The Trader Support Service is a direct intervention by the UK government to ensure that businesses can continue to trade as seamlessly as possible between Great Britain and Northern Ireland, whilst at the same time, Northern Ireland will continue to enjoy unfettered access for its trade from Northern Ireland into Great Britain. Uh, the session usually takes about an hour or so. We may run over a little bit, uh, depending on the volume of questions that we receive. We have received some already in advance, uh, but I'll hand over now to Frank, who will begin uh, the webinar for us this afternoon. Thank you. Thank you, Stephen, and um, thanks for hosting us again. It's a pleasure to be back. Um, this is actually our third deck, and it's brand new today. So I think Shankar's seeing it for the first time as he presents it today. Uh, and I'll set the context of the um, presentation um, in, in a moment. The previous two decks are available on our um, user guide um, web website. Um, it's under the Northern Ireland um, Customs Training Academy. Um, which you can get to from the Trader Support Service, uh, and including a video as well of uh, a very nice voiceover for those slides if you just want to listen um, to, to the context. Those, those slides tell you a bit more about what the Trader Service is set up to do, a bit more about the Northern Ireland Protocols uh, and some of the customs administration policies and processes that will be taking effect um, come the beginning of January. Uh, what we're going to do today, the, the big focus of today is what might be your role, uh, depending on what type of organization you are, what type of goods you're uh, transporting, and, and what sort of terms you're using to transport those goods and to move those goods. What, what sort of role would you have in, um, in moving goods in, in, in the future come January? So we're very much focusing on the flow and the responsibilities within this, this seminar. And the reason why we're doing that is because that's been overwhelming the, the feedback in the last uh, few weeks what do I do? What should I be preparing? What should I think about now? Uh, and what are the main things that I need uh, to have ready in order to be trading uh, effectively on Jan January the 1st? So that's our big focus today. We'll talk, first of all, a very quick recap, very brief recap on the um, Northern Ireland protocols, the implications of those, which I'm sure you're familiar with, but it, it just sets the scene. Uh, and then Shankar, once Shankar's done that, he'll take you through a little bit about who's doing what um, and, and you'll see the sense of that in a moment. So depending on the sort of organization and sort of terms, what, what would be your typical responsibility within the process? Um, and then we'll go into what, what are some busy process flow charts. Um, and and that will give you an indication of how the information moves around and how the process works when you move goods from A to B. So, and then we'll fi finalize, finish off with a checklist of, of how the uh, processes um, and procedures uh, you can think about in terms of readiness. Uh, we'll finish off on that towards the end and then we'll do questions. So on the next slide, please come. 
So first of all, a recap of the implications of the Northern Ireland Protocol. Uh, I'll ask Shank to take us through that. Sure. Um, can, we go, can we go to the next slide, please? Yeah, for those, for those who um, weren't able to join uh, the last uh, presentation, um, you know, this, this is a slide that was on the last presentation and it's essentially re-emphasizing what TSS actually is and how best to use it. So if I can sort of shift the focus here to um, how you use TSS from a, from a user standpoint. Um, it's a digital first service. The core of it, you know, we will be doing customs declarations for you, primarily, well then you know, not exclusively, GB to Northern Ireland. There are some, uh, there is some um, need for declarations from Northern Ireland to GB for goods and duty suspension and for goods that are, are subject to international treaties, where we will support those NI to GB required export declarations. Um, the vast majority of trade in Northern Ireland to GB doesn't require any um, export declaration, however. Um, but for the primary uh, process is GB to NI, and we will It isn't a case that you call the contact centre and you say, I need to move some goods now. Can you raise a customs form? It is a registration-based service. So since we spoke about this last, we now have, I think, north of... 16 and a half thousand traders who are registered for TSS, which is good. I mean, we've made some progress on, on registration. Um, and uh, the registration is all important because what we will need from traders is uh, their master data, which they will include in the uh, registration process. Um, it is from the combination of the haulier, the carrier company providing information so that we can raise the safety and security declaration that we talked about last time. Uh, that is raised by us on behalf of the carrier. Um, that, that combination of that declaration and the master data from the, from the um, trader enables us to raise the um, simplified frontier declaration, which is for most trade, most standard trade, uh, that is how uh, the, the flow will, will, will work. And we'll talk a bit later on about how that integrates into all the other different processes that are, are involved. So you can see where you, fit into the, where you fit into the process. And there is an enormous amount of education and advice that is all free from the Northern Ireland Customs and Trade Academy. Um, and that, um, you know, it's been uh, up and running for some weeks now, and uh, you should ensure that you take advantage of that. Because there's three things I think a trader needs to do. One, understand the, the underlying issues uh, of customs. Um, two, understand where you fit into the process, and that's where our process charts in, in, in the presentation will be really helpful. And then three, once you've sort of got those things, what is it that I actually have to do? And, and it's understandable that we're getting, I think we've already got one question on what is it that I have to do? But I think you'll, you'll find it a lot easier to answer that question uh, if you understand the first two things. And that's what the information on the Northern Ireland Customs and Trade Academy is all about. And then the contact center is designed to help you with issue resolution, not with raising declarations. So if, if you have, for example, I'm not entirely sure what I need to include in the SFD, uh, these are the goods that I trade, what do I need? That's the sort of question you need to be asking the contact centre. Or I've registered, but I still don't have my XIEURI number. Can you tell me what I have to do? That These are the sorts of questions you need to be asking. That, that's how to use the contact centre well. Um, we're not a personalised service. We're not going to compete with existing intermediaries. Um, uh, and that's relevant to some of the, uh, some of the flows here. And we're not going to raise the, the, the sort of export health certificates or other licenses that re would re would be required for sort of non what we call non-standard uh, trade on agriculture and SPS issues um, there is a, a, a piece of you know a, a ongoing work in DEFRA so you should certainly contact your DEFRA counterpart your, your DEFRA um, contacts uh, and also your DERA contract contacts and um, uh, there is in, in DEFRA an agri-food support service that, you know, is, is, it would help you understand what you need to do in terms of the SPS side of things. So if we can go to the next slide. Um, I'm going to pass over this fairly quickly. Um, the key group here that we need to have sight of and we need to have registered are the two at the bottom, the hauliers and the freight forwarders. That's where we get the... Um, 
the initial uh, export summary de declaration or the, the safety and security declaration, which triggers, uh, which triggers the, 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 the process. Um, so, uh, and, and on the other, on the other sort of people who would have to do customs declarations, you know, we've got, we've got some, uh, some, some things for you to look at in terms of uh, how you think about this. Uh, if you are moving goods across the boundary, GB to NI, you are going to have to do customs declarations and we will do them on your behalf, provided you are registered with us. Um, the uh, computing chain issue, we've had a lot of questions about, well, I'm doing intra-company movements. I, I've got a, I've got a stock, stock transfer form. I don't have a commercial invoice. A stock transfer form is fine. You can use that to do the to do the declarations, but since you are moving goods across the boundary, you definitely need to to do those declarations. So if we go to the next slide. Um, so so in, in these these five sort of principal movements, um, and we can talk a bit about them in a bit more detail. Um, there are new declarations, and there may be duties that have to be paid depending on on, on the at-risk or not at-risk classification. We are hoping to be able, and again, it's another question that we get right out at, right out of the gate, and and it's totally understandable. How do I get into the not at-risk category? Because there are obviously going to be benefits from the perspective of simplifications and not having to pay a duty um, if I'm in the not at-risk category. Uh, that is still subject to the joint committee uh, decision-making process, but we understand that tomorrow we hopefully will have a bit more clarity one way or the other uh, on this point. And we do want to get to traders and we do want to explain to you what it is that you'd have to do to get into the not at risk category. What I can say is that, you know, there's been lots of speculation about a, a, a risk, a list of commodities that would be at risk or not at risk. It's much more likely to be evidence based in terms of your movements. Uh, in other words, think about now what kind of evidence I have that my movements only move GBNI and don't uh, go into uh, in, into into Ireland. Um, Northern Ireland to GB, again, it's only goods and duty suspension that would require export uh, declaration. So if you're moving from a bonded warehouse in NI to a bonded warehouse in GB, you might require, you will require export declarations. Um, if your goods are subject to international treaties, such as CITES or the Kimberley diamond mining process, this sort of thing, uh, you will require uh, declarations. No change and no procedures and no checks Northern Ireland to and from Ireland uh, beyond what you already do. So that doesn't change at all under the protocol. Um, and Northern Ireland to and from rest of the world will benefit from UK free trade agreements if there's greater market access in those agreements with respect to the third country than exists in the EU uh, uh, third country um, FTA. And for goods coming in, uh, you will either be uh, paying a duty based on the uh, common external tariff of the EU if the goods are at risk, or you'll be paying the UK global tariff if the goods are not at risk. So again, not at risk, at risk, very important for that process as well. And we are very conscious that transit uh, people, uh, there is a lot of use of transit from GB to NI via the Holyhead Dublin channel. We will support those transit declarations um uh, in tss uh but what you will need to do we we in tss have a um transit uh guarantee uh, which is needed under the the the, the ncts the, the transit convention uh process um and we have authorized consign in all locations um we anticipate having authorized consign locations as well uh so um Ordinarily, you'd have to close your transit in a authorised consignee location in Northern Ireland. Um, and um, we understand that for a number, particularly for SBS goods traders, you are going to be, uh, you, you cannot change your logistics. Um, you, you have to use the Holyhead Dublin route to get product into Northern Ireland and transit will enable you to continue to do that. It does not prevent the uh, checking of the SPS goods uh, at the first point of entry into the EU, which is Dublin. And that's where there would be uh, a potential for an SPS check, I mean, a physical uh, intervention um, where the truck would essentially be stopped. It would be unsealed if it was sealed and there would be an inspection and then the truck would be allowed to, to, to move on uh, into Northern Ireland. 
transit would then be closed and um the the ordinary from a trader perspective um you'll continue to do the sfd uh, and the uh, supplementary de declaration process that will close that that plus the authorized consignee location will close the transit um and enable the goods to uh, arrive in free circulation in um in northern ireland so if we go to the next slide um I think actually what we we'll probably do, Frank, is move to the next slide um, and talk, and the next one, sorry, and talk about the uh, actual process of of of, of moving uh, of moving the goods. Um, so I guess I'll, I'll cover this one and then go, Frank, to you after this. Um, so. Uh, the question here is if i am moving goods from gb to ni what do i specifically need to do and we have to differentiate the hauliers and the freight forwarders and the entry summary declaration from what the traders responsibilities are so the, these are the processes that you need to uh, you, you are going to need to engage with and what we'd like to do is to explain to you the processes to explain then the flow uh, which frank will do um uh, with these flow diagrams so you can see where I fit into the process and then you will want to have a, essentially a checklist of this is what I need to start working on this is what I need to give and this is how I'm going to interface with TSS so um, entry summary declaration is needed for um, so if you think about it in terms of a standard goods process um, entry summary declaration has to be done by the haulier or the carrier um, uh, we will raise that declaration on the on the carrier's behalf. Uh, there is an ENS portal um, uh, that uh, TSS will have, and that's how those entries will be made. I think one of the things we can do at the end of this, we will send you this deck as soon as it's approved and and authorized by HMRC. But we will also make available to to you uh, a zip file that has um, a number of, of of useful things in it. All the presentations plus uh, some of the TSS bulletins that registered traders re receive on a weekly basis which include a link to bulk upload uh, if that's of interest to you and also um, the ENS portal demonstration link um, uh, because then you can see how you know what is the information I need to provide and how do I provide it uh, and I think that will be very useful simplified frontier declaration and supplementary declaration this is the process by which we're going to move goods you know in trucks roll on roll off into northern ireland you use the simplified frontier declaration where you can which you can do as any trader because you are using our i.e tss's uh, cfsp authorization you're using the authorization we have you don't need to have it yourself and therefore you can use these simplified processes so you can flow the goods into Northern Ireland uh, without having to produce all the information that you'd ordinarily have to produce. You can produce that in the supplementary declaration, which you can do at the end uh, on the fourth day of the month after the month of movement. The ones in, in blue are the ones that we will support. The ones in black are, are necessarily are, are necessary. But and you have to engage with them, but the TSS won't directly support you, will indirectly support you by telling you about them as we're doing today and as our educational material provides. So GVMS is the other, is the goods vehicle movement service, which is how the truck is going to move. So the hauliers and the freight forwarders and the carriers need to be linked into GVMS um, so that they can get the GMR, the, the, the goods movement reference, um, and we'll, we'll, we'll show you a slide that shows how the GMS, GVMS process works. Uh, GMR is incredibly important because the goods movement reference is what enables you to the, enables the truck to move through the ferry terminal. No GMR, no movement through the ferry terminal. Uh, and a GMR is constructed from a combination of the GVMS uh, process and, and declarations. The, the individual MRNs um, for each of the consignments on board the truck, the, which is, so you have, you have a sort of electronic env envelope that has all this, uh, all these declarations in them, including critically the customs declarations that are necessary on the truck. Um, it's the combination of the MRNs that gives you the the, the GMR, and 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 so you and so you can move through. For SPS goods. 
Uh, same same sorts of things that you need, entry summary declaration, simplified frontier supplementary declaration, but the difference is that you need to provide different things for the simplified frontier declaration. So it isn't quite as simplified as it would be for the standards goods process and we'll tell you what is needed for SBS goods. It, broadly speaking, you need to put some things like the 10 digit import commodity code in to your, sim to your simplified frontier declaration. Uh, so, so there's a timing issue. You can't wait till the supplementary declaration to put your import commodity codes in. You'll need GVMS as well in the same way that we discussed before. And you will also additionally need export health certificates. Um, uh, you'll need traces, notifications. You might need other licenses. You, you, you will need um, CHED, CHED forms. Um, and um, the important thing to note there is that on January 1, the competent entity for some of these processes, particularly things like traces, um, will move from DEFRA to DERA. So you need to have your contacts within, uh, your contacts within DERA are the people you need to be talking to about this. Um, it is in anticipated that the UK will have a, um, a, a way to try to simplify the export health certificates that are required. Um, and um, uh, they will do that through groupage schemes such as JEFs uh, and, and the digital scheme like RMS. Um, but um, uh, it doesn't take away from the fact that VET has to have personal authorization, personal knowledge, personal experience over, uh, over the certifications that, that, the, um, that he's making, he or she is making. And then for control, other controlled goods and excise goods, um, you would have more, even more of an enriched data set that we would be needed on the SFD and we'll provide you a list of all of those things that would be necessary. Um, and certainly some traders would say, well, if we're going to do all of that, we'll simply do a full frontier declaration. Um, and, and, and certainly we, TSS, will ultimately be able to support the, the FFD as well. Um, uh, and then you've got EMS, which is the excise control system which has a pre-import notification process. And then there are certain special licenses. So control goods that are not SPS goods. So I'm thinking particularly here of goods that are subject to export controls. Uh, there you would need the, um, uh, the OGEL, the, the export control license um, uh, as well uh, as, you sub uh, as you finalize this process. So if we go to the next slide. A um, couple of things where, where we've still got ongoing negotiations, so we can't give you um, total uh, guidance on this. Um, specifically chilled products where you've got, you know, you're placing goods on, on the market where um, things are, are, are placed on the market prior to the operative date. Um, exact specification of food, food products. This is um, uh, information that we will aim to get to you as soon as we have sight of what it is. Uh, the, the precise rules on labeling and packaging. It is, it is, it is true that uh, under the protocol, uh, both European SPS rules and European TBT, technical regulation applies. So uh, technically EU, um, labeling rules would 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 apply uh, and and that also relates to the CA which is the UK mark the CA mark um, versus the European CE mark uh, which you'd have to put on the on, on the product and a lot of this relates a lot of these two things relate to the at risk not at risk classification and, and how that's resolved in the joint committee if we go to the next slide um, I'll, I'll just talk about transit um, and that particularly that Hollyhead Dublin route, which we know is very important to to, to traders. Uh, and I mentioned, you know, the, the 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 things that you are going to have to to raise here, or your haulier or freight forwarder is going to have to raise. From a trader perspective, the import declaration process, the SFD and supplementary declaration, remains the same. Uh, the ENS uh, process for the haulier remains the same. Now you have an additional process if you're using transit and, and you'd use obviously you'd use transit to make sure that there is no, um, uh, you can move the goods from, G, from one bit of the UK customs territory GB to another bit of the UK customs territory Northern Ireland via a third customs, via a different customs territory, which is uh, Ireland. 
So there's a transit process that sits on sits alongside all of this. And what you need there is uh, a transit guarantee in order to use the transit process. Um, the for some traders, particularly authorized economic operators, you can lower the, the requirements for the guarantee. Um, if you don't have a transit guarantee, and we're aware that there are many, many traders who won't, not only will, will they not have a transit guarantee, they probably don't have a clear pathway to getting one. Um, don't worry about that. We, If you're in that category and you do use this transit route, uh, TSS has a transit guarantee and you can use the TSS transit guarantee um, to, um, to ensure that goods can be moved. Uh, you will need an authorised consign or authorised consignee. Um, uh, and again, TSS has, uh, has an authorised consignee location. Uh, we'll, we're well on the way to getting the, the appropriate authorised consignee locations. Um, and uh, again, from a transit perspective, this is really primarily the hauliers, your hauliers, your freight forwarders, your carriers, who are going to be worrying about this, this aspect of it. Transit is closed when you hit the authorised consignee location. Uh, messages are sent uh, to the European, the, to the NCTS system. Um, there are messages between the Office of Departure and the Office of Destination. Um, the trader doesn't see any of that. The trader is not that is not concerned about that. The haulier or carrier. Um, has a, a, a set of messages they have to send, which we will do on their behalf, and uh, and then the process is completely closed off with an with an alternative customs process, which would include the the back to the SFD and the and the supplementary declaration route, and then the goods are cleared um, to uh, for free circulation in Northern Ireland. Um, so there are certain things that uh, are, are are additional. Uh, and here, it's very important uh, to understand that even if you're using transit, that doesn't mean that even though you're, tran you're using transit to avoid customs, or not to have to do the customs procedures uh, at the point of entry into the EU, which is Dublin, that doesn't absolve you from having to go through the SPS um, uh, documentation and checks. Uh, and there could be checks in Dublin at the border control post. Go to the next slide, please. Sure. Shankar, um, shall I take the, the next few slides yeah, to go to the flow? Yeah. Yes, okay. yeah, exactly. I'll give you a break. <laughs> Thank you very much. Um, so Shankar's taken us through um, uh, an overview of the, uh, um, a checklist, if you like, of, of, of the ver various documents and customs administration procedures that are required for different types of goods and different routes. Um, so now there's a big question of well, who's doing what. Uh, so we'll take you through um, a breakdown of, of how we work through who's doing what. Uh, and then I'll show you the process flow. So first of all, let's just level set who's involved in the process. And we're using the following terms typically. On the left hand side, there you have freight forwarders. Uh, they arrange um, logistics and, and uh, uh, transport. And some, sometimes they also do customs administration on your behalf. Um, we have various carriers, road, air and sea, uh, who actually physically move stuff, consignors who are supplying the goods and consignees who actually buy the goods. Um, and then you have intermediaries and, and brokers, customs intermediaries, a bit like the TSS, who provide added value uh, services to create customs documentation um, for, for, uh, for those movements. Uh, so those are the terms that we tend to use, um, but what role do they play um, in, and who does what depends on a number of factors. So who's organizing transport? It could be a number of those uh, organizations. Who's doing the safety and security declaration? Who's actually moving goods for you, et cetera? Uh, who's responsible for payment of duties or taxes if, if they are relevant? Who creates guarantees um, to, to ensure things like transit? And in order to answer that on the next slide, I was trying to advance the slides there. Um, we have something called INCO terms. Um, these are the 2020 definition of INCO terms, international um, recognized terms. And what they basically do, there's an awful lot of information there. So the, the, if you haven't seen this before, this actually tells us who's responsible for what in the movement of those goods, for what process in the movement of those goods. And um, on the left-hand side, right on the left-hand side, there you have a number of custom process called custom processes, those are the ENCO terms. EXW is X works. 
And at the bottom, you've got DDP, which is delivered duty paid. So they're the kind of two extremes. And in the middle, you've got different variations. And then you can see where we've got seller in green and buyer in, in pink. In broad terms, your responsibility as a seller or a buyer will sit in one of those boxes. This, sorry, this, this chart will tell you what your responsibility is depending on the income term. So a really important item here is for you to understand, no matter what role you have, but for you to understand what the income terms are for the movement of those goods. And depending on that, you will have a different responsibility or not. So along the very top of the, of the chart, there is the, the various uh, activities, loading uh, the original goods, creating the export declaration, um, carriage of the goods to the port, unloading onto the port, et cetera. It goes into some detail, et cetera, but you, you get, you get the, um, the gist of that. So if they're delivered X works, basically on the next slide, I'll show you the, um, the summary version of it, the two extremes. Uh, if it's if it's coming X works, then you as the receiver, it might not be you, sorry, but the, the trader in Northern Ireland who's receiving these goods has to arrange to transport. They have to submit the declarations or they're responsible for submitting the declarations and they are responsible for any duties and tax that may or may not be payable on those goods. So that's the top level of the INCO terms. And on the bottom level of the INCO term, you've got delivered duty paid, where the responsibility switches all the way over. So it's actually the sender, the person you're buying this stuff from, who arranges the transport, who creates the declarations, and who pays the duty on your behalf as well. So in order to understand your role and 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 your responsibilities within within the uh, process, INCO terms are absolutely critical. And on the next slide, we just want to illustrate that even with the INCO terms, you still have to provide information. And I noticed there was a question, I was just looking through the, the Q&A uh, uh, earlier. Um, my freight forwarder or my carrier says, I don't have to do any of the information because TSS will do it. So in straight answer to that, everybody has a role despite the INCO terms in terms of information. So even if I'm getting DDP, delivered duty paid, and I'm the buyer in Northern Ireland, I still got to give my location address and I still need an EORI number. Possibly don't need the EORI number, but I at least need the, the uh, location address. So there's something needed. Um, and depending on who you are in that chain, you will need to, to ensure you've got the right information. The carrier absolutely must have information that that will enable us to complete the safety and security declaration. It's their responsibility, no matter what the income term is. So they must understand the transport route, who, whose goods they're transporting, who they're transporting them to, um, the, the ferry details, the nature of the goods, the weight of the goods. So all of the safety and security information the carrier must have. They will get it from different organizations in the supply chain. So it'll be up to the supplier to say, here's a description of the goods, here's the net weights, here's the information that you need in order to do that. So even though INCO terms are really important in terms of what your responsibility is, don't feel that you've been let off the hook in terms of supplying information. And the TSS doesn't have that information unless we're given it by somebody. Our primary route for the processes we've talked about, our primary source is the carrier. So the carriers are really, really important to us in terms of getting that information. And on the next slide, I think we've got a very busy slide here and we're going to tidy this up for the next release. Um, so you'll get a prettier version of this, but um, we, we've had a lot of questions around how does it work then? So, so once you've understood your INCO terms, who's doing what, how do the goods go from, uh, in this case, GB to Northern Ireland? And we're taking a direct route on this one. So we're using our simple route. Uh, and on the very left-hand side, we've got the blue boxes, um, ferry operator, HMRC, TSS, haulier, and supplier, or buyer. So those are the organizations involved that we talked about earlier. Um, this is irrespective of INCO terms. So I'll, I'll walk through this flow, and then Kevin will talk about some variations on it in the next slides. But um, on the bottom left, somebody's got to buy some goods, and somebody's got to provide the goods. So you've got a consignor and a consignee, and they're the ones that give that information. Uh, it's, it's two tables and a chair. Here's the information and the value of them, and it goes to the haulier. Um, so the haulier needs to get the information of the supplier, the buyer, and the goods. The haulier then gives that information to the TSS, and we have two processes in TSS. So I'm going up that 
that first column. Um, we send that information from the Horlier into the HMRC system. In this case, it's CDS and, uh, and um, ICS. Uh, and then that returns to us um, MRNs, movement reference numbers. So provided that data is okay, it goes into CDS and pops out with a, uh, with a movement number or, or maybe several movement numbers for that particular um, shipment, for that particular lorry load. We send that information to the Horlier and the Horlier's then got the MRNs uh, for that particular shipment. So the Horlier's now got all the information they need uh, in terms of the declarations for all of the items on that, that transport. They have another step and, and the color changes because this isn't a, a TSS service uh, where they, they now need to go into GVMS, the Goods Vehicle Management System. So the Horlier will have to do this, I'm afraid. And they'll put similar information in, in terms of vehicle IDs, journeys, uh, and they'll put the MRNs that we've just given the Horlier, they'll put those into G the GVMS system. Um, and as I mentioned, there could be 10, 20, or even more MRNs for, for one uh, vehicle movement. Um, and they'll put all of those MRNs into the GVMS. Once you've got that, the Horlier can then go to, um, well, we've actually got a little step in there. So it goes to HMRC, um, it's input on the um, GVMS system, and they receive the, G the GMR number back. So we've got that little loop in there. Uh, once, they, once they've got that um, GMR number from, from GV GVMS, if I can add any more acronyms, I'll have a go. The GMR is a good movement uh, reference number. They can then go to the port. So right the way up the top there, it goes to the port. Um, it's the ferry operator that will check the GMR. So they'll look at that. That process will go back into the HMRC systems and there may be 10 declarations associated with that vehicle and that GMR. It will go off behind the scenes and start checking those declarations. And then we've got this journey across, goods move across the Irish Sea. And then as we go back down there, um, the hauler will be contacted on the basis of those checks as it's crossing the sea. Um, and they may or may not have to stop for a physical check in the port. So um, the, the box is kind of overlapping with TSS there, but the message will go to the Horlier, not to TSS. Um, so we are not involved in that message process um, back, back to the Horlier. So whilst, whilst the, just to recap, whilst the lorry's on the ferry going to Northern Ireland, the, the declarations will be checked by HMRC. And if any of them are flagged for inspection, it could be a document or physical inspection, they will notify the Horlier um, who will notify the driver uh, that they need to be um, checked and they need to go to the inspection post. Um, the goods are then, once they're free, free to leave the um, port, uh, they then are delivered to the consignee, the, the buyer, uh, who receives the goods right at the bottom down there. Um, and that's where there's, there's a kind of a break in the process there. There are no arrows to the right of that. Um, and the way TSS works is we are using the arrival date on the entry safety and security declaration. So right at the beginning, you're telling us what, what ferry the goods are going on and when they will arrive in Northern Ireland. Uh, and we're using that date to say, right, you've told us they'll arrive on that date. So we, we will then send a request uh, to um, the declarant, and I'll use that term, the declarant, to say, you've had the following goods. Um, can you please provide uh, imp the, the following information uh, by the 4th of the following month? Um, who does that go to? That depends on the INCO terms. So as I mentioned before, if it's X works, it'll go to the buyer. If it's DDP, deliver duty paid, it'll go to the uh, supplier. Uh, so we'll know that from the declaration, the original declaration right at the beginning, because you will have to told us who the supplier, uh, who the um, declarant is on that, on that original uh, declaration. Uh, and then we've got a, a final box, which, um, we will then submit the declaration for you into, into the government system and close off that declaration process. If the goods are at risk, there may be a, a, a duty paid um, or payable, uh, which we will then collect off the uh, declarant uh, by the 15th, I believe, of that month, of the following month. Um, and that depends, of course, on, on trade agreements. So that's our, our flow. It's, it's not a pretty diagram at the moment. We will, we will make the, um, the release version prettier. Uh, but I'm hoping that gives you an idea of where things move. And the previous slides have given you an idea of 
what your role may be depending on who you are and the encode terms. And what I'm going to ask Kevin to do, catch him out a little bit, is on the next slide, we've got three more slides. Um, we've got one on SPS. What's the difference with SPS? If we can hold it there. And then after that, we can do a control excise and then transit. So we put some gray box, gray, green boxes in there. Kevin, would you mind just illustrating the difference with the um, SPS on that flow? So in addition to what we've talked about, which is standard goods, non-controlled goods, for products of animal and plant origin, um, you've got some green boxes in there. Yeah, certainly, Frank, and uh, good afternoon, everybody. So looking at the slide and, and the green boxes, uh, for, for, for SPS goods, which clearly could be products of animal origin, uh, plants as well for phytosanitary purposes, uh, there will be requirement for an export health certificate. So, so in the case of products of animal origin, which must be signed off by an official vet. Uh, and so um, uh, uh, GB... Uh, uh, suppliers will need to be aware of that. Um, and um, there, there is a requirement for import pre-notification into traces uh, 24 hours prior to import into Northern Ireland. I'm, I'm aware that DERA uh, held a, a webinar, I think, uh, last Monday, uh, which started to, to uh, also introduce and explain the com uh, 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 requirements there. So there's a requirement for import pre-notification. Uh, it is possible that upon arrival in Northern Ireland, the haulier may be uh, directed to a border uh, control post, so uh, e effectively for, a, for an SPS check of the goods. So it's important for, for SPS goods that, that, uh, that both the uh, GB supplier uh, and the uh, Northern Ireland buyer are aware of the requirements, which is why it's important that everybody in the whole supply chain um, signs up for the trader support service and registers in that there'll be uh, additional training on this area. And just looking at some of the questions, I know a few questions on INCO terms. So INCO terms agreed between the supplier and the Northern Ireland buyer. So these are the uh, trade of terms agreed uh, as, as to covering areas as uh, who arranges to freight and ultimately who is responsible for the declaration. But bearing in mind the, uh, the TSS operating model, which, which we've described and we're describing today. Thank you. We have a next slide, please. So uh, with regard to controlled and excise goods, uh, they're, they're also may require to be, for certain types of controlled goods, uh, a specific licenses required. Uh, and again, important to sign up to the Northern Ireland Customs and Trade Academy because there will be some, some, uh, some elements when, when goods enter Northern Ireland from Great Britain where, where, where specific licenses are required. And some may again be subject to international conventions such as uh, CITES for, for, for trade in endangered species. Um, and there will be a requirement in terms of excise goods to, uh, to, to, to notify the EMCS system in moving excise goods from uh, GB to Northern Ireland. Uh, and, and again, subject to the controlled goods and the nature of the controlled goods upon arrival into Northern Ireland, the haulier may need to stop for physical and document checks. But again, really, really important that the requirements for these certain types of products and these goods uh, are, are, are adhered to and the importance of, of all parts of the supply chain to register for the uh, trader support service so they can receive specific training and guides which is being produced. Uh, and if we have the next slide, please. Thank you. Great, and I'm going to, I uh, think I'm going to pass over to Shankar now on transit. I'm happy to do this one, but happy to leave it to Shankar. Thank you. Yeah, and I think I, I sort of outlined some of this uh, earlier on uh, in the discussion, but we, what we've included here is is how the, um, in the sort of purple boxes, um, uh, how the transit process operates. So you've got to, transit is primarily an issue, uh, or will be an issue between um, the haulier, the freight forwarder, and, and TSS. So if you're a trader and you're using transit um, and you've engaged a, a haulier to, to move your goods via, let's say, the Holyhead Dublin route, uh, you, you will have, um, you won't see a difference in what you have to do in terms of this process. That's why there are no purple boxes in your, in your supplier buyer role. Uh, but the haulier will have to do, um, uh, will have to in, engage with the transit process. If they have their own transit guarantee, um, and some of some of your hauliers may well have, um, then they can use their own transit guarantee 
and their own authorized consignor location uh, or their own um, office of departure. Uh, they and if they don't, then TS they can essentially do this on TSS's transit guarantee. Um, they will receive um, the, the the transit accompanying document, which goes with the goods uh, and with the driver. Um, what TSS's role would be um, is we would raise the transit movement um, and the documentation on um, the NCTS system, which is the European um, Transit Convention uh, system. Uh, what HMRC would do, we would then communicate with HMRC and HMRC would generate the, the transit MRN, which is different from the, um, um, the specific you know, goods MRNs um, for each of those consignments. Um, uh, the, the NCTS system, you know, which we will be communicating with on behalf of TSS, will generate the transit accompanying document. That goes back to the haulier and the haulier then uh, uses that to move the goods so the, the, the truck starts starts to move the uh, transit mrn goes from hmrc to uh, tss we we again we pass that on just as we do in in in, in other cases um uh, that creates for the haulier uh, an mrn for each consignment uh, and then you go through the same process that you would on the ordinary standard you know route where you have the um, uh, GMR that, that is raised uh, in the same way um, uh, and that is validated in the same way as the as the truck goes um, through the Hollyhead Dublin uh, through, through the, into the ferry terminal the Hollyhead and then goes into the Hollyhead Dublin um, ferry journey. Um, they move into Ireland, they, they will receive clearance from the Office of Transit in Ireland and this is something that the, that the haulier will uh, or the carrier will will receive. Um, and they, they then go um, uh, to 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 cons consignees. Now you have to close the, um, uh, the the transit process either at an authorized consignee location or at the office of destination. The office of destination is the customs office in Belfast. That does not necessarily mean that your truck has to go to the office. Uh, in Belfast, you know, we're working on a, uh, on, on a way of ensuring that that, that can be done at the, um, at, the, uh, po at the point of unloading. Uh, but once the, once the transit is closed, then you go through the same process that you've, you've essentially gone in uh, previously with the ENS declaration, the SFD, the, C, the, the, um, um, the SFD into CDS and, 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 and so on. Uh, and that's what enables the goods to move. So from a trader perspective, from a supplier or a buyer perspective, um, the, the, this does not look very different for you. It's the, it's the haulier who will see the, the, the greatest difference with respect to a transit, uh, with respect to a transit movement. Um, so uh, if we can go to the next slide. Um, uh, I don't know if um, Kevin wants to pick up this one so happy thank you very much indeed so uh, i think it's very important as as businesses whether you're the northern Ireland buyer uh, the gb supplier or the or the carrier hoardier to 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 make sure you have a checklist of procedures so to to obviously understand your, your role in the um, in in the in the goods movement and the uh, and the sale so, uh, and that links in, as we said, around INCO terms as well, to make sure that INCO terms, uh, terms of trade agreed. And I noticed one question, I think, on XWorks under the Q&A. Under the Q if, you are, if you are purchasing on XWorks terms or any, any INCO term between GB and Northern Ireland, you will require an XIORI, uh, and that will need to be quoted and used. If you are a carrier or a hoardier, again, to, to, to create the checklist and look at the operating model uh, in, in terms of providing the, uh, the data to enable the safety and security declaration. And also then, if you're, if you're a customs intermediary, a freight forwarder, what your role is, is there. And the idea of these checklists is to provide an overview of for all these routes, but very, very much primarily focused on the T uh, TSS process. Uh, and if you have, a, um, as we've looked at, a dish, um, certain products, products of animal origin, controlled goods, is to consider the additional requirements. So very much break it down into your position in the supply 
chain and the nature of the goods and the interaction with the TSS, but also the interaction with hauliers uh, and freight forwarders as well. Uh, if we pass to the next slide, please. Um, so, um, yeah, again, sort of happy to take this. So very, very important to, to register, which, uh, which I'm sure I very much hope everyone has done on this call, but you haven't, please register now. Um, encourage your carriers and, and, and suppliers to register as well. Agree in co-terms and then consider obviously using an in intermediary if necessary to complete declarations on your behalf, but bearing in mind the TSS operating model. Uh, if you have products, to, to be clear on the commodity code, so on the Northern Ireland Customs Trade Academy, uh, th there is, uh, there's how-to guides around, uh, around commodity codes. Uh, and then really understanding the TSS process. So if you're a haulier, your role in that process. Uh, and as, as Shank has referred to on the Northern Ireland Customs Trade Academy, there are how-to guides on the actual data required to enable uh, the entry safety and security declaration and also a bulk upload uh, if, if you have a, a, a volume of transactions. And we will be providing further data around the data sets required for supplementary declarations uh, as well. If we have the next slide, please. So, um, uh, do you, Shank or Frank, want to take this? I'm happy to do it. I don't mind. Her. Sure, I can. I can uh, do this. If we can go to, we're going to talk about Northern Ireland to GB now, um, and and specifically what is required um, Northern Ireland to GB. What we've said already is that um, they won't require, in general, they won't require export declarations. There are specific exemptions to this, and they relate to. As, as Kevin just said, the, um, the goods that are subject to um, international treaties like CITES uh, or Kimberley Diamond Mining and so on. Um, and in the particular exception that probably affects more people is goods moving in duty suspension, which do require export declarations. Um, uh, so this, this, in order to understand whether whether I as an as an NI exporter have to to to, to do an export declaration, just so you understand the the the, the, the sort of volumes here, about fourteen million goods movements um, between NI and GB. Only about half a million of those would be requiring export declarations um, uh, under under these rules. Um, and, and essentially, you look at for things, if, if goods are in temporary storage, which is a particular type of customs facilitation, uh, if there are special procedures, as I say, bonded warehouse to bonded warehouse, or if they're indirect exports that start outside Northern Ireland, if they're coming from the EU uh, and, and, and they're going across from Northern Ireland into GB, then they might require export declarations. Um, if we go to the next slide. Uh, and I'll ask Kevin to finish up with the updates if we go to the next slide in terms of NICTA training modules, Kevin. Yeah, thank you very much indeed. So um, what we can see here is what's been produced already. Uh, and we've referred to some of those. So the likes of the, uh, the requirements for the safety and security declaration, which, which is applicable for all types of businesses and including hauliers as well. And that, that indicates the specific data that's required. Um, there is um, for, for smaller businesses, perhaps businesses less familiar with uh, with trade operations. There is the likes of the introduction to customs guide and GB to NI uh, uh, trade in uh, trade movements. There's both webinars and how to guides as well. And I know we've had quite a few questions on Inco terms today. There is a there is a guide on how to use Inco terms as well. So please, please use the, the, the information. And you can see we, we, we have a number of uh, uh, guides, modules being produced around the ORI numbers, the supplementary declaration requirements, and very much the, uh, uh, the declarations overview and other journeys. So we have a wide range of information coming up. Thank you very much. There's just one more slide there, which is, um, uh, around uh, APIs. Um, so the purpose of this slide, and I'm just aware of time, we be good to get questions. Um, so as well as uh, keying information into the portal, the TSS portal to raise declarations, some, some organizations will have an awful lot of information to be uh, required to be uh, input into those, into those screens. Um, and they may well be able to extract that information from their existing systems. Um, and 
in, in that situation, those supermarkets, for example, um, there is an API um, procedure, which is, for those of you who aren't technical, it's just um, a, a protocol that allows you to send the information uh, remotely via, um, in, in a digital format. Um, and that process, uh, we're just working through finalizing that process at the moment. You, if you're interested in using that uh, uh, bulk upload, as we call it, that automated upload, then um, register on the um, on the um, trader support service site for the uh, for the service, and you can download the uh, documentation which tells you how to do that, what the design of the APIs are. It will need your IT departments to get their heads around that, uh, and then you can, um, I believe, in early December there'll be some test uh, sites available um, to test those API upload uh, uh, procedures that you can build. Um, and finally, on the last slide, it's just the, the holding slide, which is a reminder to register. But hopefully we've given you a flavor as well um, to, uh, to encourage your supply chain to register. You can see from the, the slides that we've talked about there, if you don't have everyone else in the supply chain registered, then there will be gaps and the TSS won't be able to serve that entire journey. Uh, and the training courses on NICTA are available for you now. So I think if we leave it there, um, and we go to the Q and A. Probably the easiest way to do it. Frank, uh, Shankar, and Kevin, thanks for that. Uh, as is always the case, we have quite a considerable number of questions. We'll, yeah. we'll maybe give it another ten minutes or so because I know that Kevin's had to go and Frank's has to go shortly. But just to reassure everyone, we're taking a note of all the questions. We'll provide you with answers. We'll leave, email them out to everyone. And those that we can't directly answer, we'll, we'll get clarity from uh, Frank and the team uh, at TSS as well. Can I just start uh, maybe first with the XI EORI numbers? Uh, I think I saw a slide there at the end that said that those details will be coming out this week. There's quite a lot of uh, questions around that, whether when they're arriving, when you need to use those, do your GB suppliers require one as well? Uh, and those sort of questions, Frank, do you want to maybe take that? Um, XIORI numbers should be, um, for those of you that registered on TSS, they should be uh, available very shortly. Um, I think it's the 11th, Jan. Could you know the, the confirmed I think, date? I think, I think there's an auto enrollment plan for the 14th. Of oh, December. 14th, sorry. Um, but they, <laughs> I know we've said that, um, that you would be auto enrolled by November 23rd. Um, there, there, there were some issues between the UK and the EU on, on that process that held things up a bit, but um, uh, but the, you will be getting the XIE and you do need, uh, basically the way to think about it is if you're putting, you're doing a declaration on a UK facing system such as ICS for um, the entry uh, summary declaration, um, that will need to, uh, you will need a GB EORI number for that. If you're doing an, a, a declaration onto an EU-facing system, such as CDS, which is your import declaration, you will need an XI EORI number for that. So that, that's how they. That, that's how, why you need both, and all why different elements of the of the supply chain need both. So, uh, but you will be getting the the XI EORI. We'll keep letting you know that 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 you know on that deadline of December the fourteenth. But um, in terms of auto enrolment. Okay, and Shankar, we know that there's some GB customers already asking firms in Northern Ireland for the XIORI number. What should we tell those people in the meantime? Well, it sort of relates to the issue, first of all, of the INCO terms. And if, if you know, what is the INCO term? Is it DD, DDP? If it's DDP, then actually it's the GB supplier that needs to have the XIORI number. If it's not DDP, um, then uh, the Northern Ireland importer, yes, indeed, does have to have that XIE uh, What What I would tell uh, the GB supplier is we are registered on TSS. We're in that uh, in that line for the auto enrollment. We will have our XIE um, hopefully by December 14th, at which point we will communicate that to you and we will be ready uh, as part of the SFD subdeck process to provide that, that uh, XIE number so that the appropriate declarations can be made okay and frank maybe this is a technical one as in a technology one the the ability to upload data i think again those details are due this week can you and apologies if we're repeating some stuff but sometimes you need to tell people 
uh, things a few times before it fully registers. When when are people expected to begin the upload of their data? The um, the the information that describes the API process and the the design requirements is already on the guide site on NICTA. So you can download that and you can register for um, for use use of the API. Um, and that will give you enough information to start actually building those those files and that process within your um, your own IT systems, etc. In terms of uh, being able to upload it to a test service, it's likely to be the first week of December. We're aiming for that test service to be to be available. That's three to four weeks. About four weeks. Oh, sorry, first week of December, second week of December. What am I talking about? Um, so so it should be ready next week sometime. Um, we're getting a bit already in December, aren't we? Um, and uh, that will give you the opportunity to try and test the API protocols that you've built, because you'll, you'll probably need some testing on those as well. They're not, they're not um, uh, trivial, as it were. Um, and then the, the actual upload service should be available um, and go live at the, beginning of the, uh, at the beginning of the year. Okay, there's just one question here. Someone had begun uploading UK-based supplier details onto TSS as requested, but the link stopped working last week and they're waiting so, for some feedback. Yeah, is, so, is that so, being repaired? Yeah, so I, I think the, the best way of handling those sort of inquiries is, you know, we have a 700 person or soon to be 700 person contact center in Northern Ireland. And it, it, it's, um, you know, th th they are best placed to handle those those sorts of inquiries. You know, we, it, we, are, we, we anticipate, you know, you know, services do go down from time to time and there are, you know, t problems from time to time, but it's probably better to, to take that issue up and get, get used to using the contact centre in the in the most um, efficient way, which is to ask exactly that kind of question uh, of the contact centre um, uh, agents and they can, they can point you in the right direction. Okay, there's one or two similar sort of questions there. So they, they, the best advice is just get in touch is, and if you haven't had the answer you need, just, just keep... Uh, chasing that down. Uh, CDS, it's kind of critical to this whole process. Yeah. Uh, when do we expect uh, CDS uh, to be available? And there is some comments that some of the existing software suppliers aren't, uh, aren't in a position to support that just yet. Have, do we have any insight into when those issues could be resolved? Yeah, so... So, so we in TSS, you know, we, we are using a CSP for our CES uh, link and we anticipate based on the testing and so forth that's going on that that will be ready by, 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 the, by the 1st of Jan. Um, uh, and we understand that for others, it may not be ready. And therefore we are in conversations with some of the intermediaries and, uh, and others as to how we can um, Make available our our interface to CDS, so that's the that's the function that TSS would play uh, in that overall uh, sort of trader trader journey. Um, uh, but um, you know, we we are we're very conscious that we may be the only entity that has that CDS up and up link up and up and running on day one, uh, and we'll make provision and HMRC will make provision for for that. Um, I'm going to have to run very soon, so I just wanted to pick up one of the questions, Stephen, if I might, um, because um, there was one question I think that talked about, and you know, how do we? Uh, our haulier is telling us that that um, PSS will handle everything, and we don't know how. How do we get them to? Uh, I just wanted to highlight uh, for that person that uh, Lord Agnew, who's the minister, HMRC minister and Treasury minister responsible for 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 this, uh, has written a letter to all of the hauliers. Uh, in the UK, essentially saying, to, explaining to them exactly what their role is, why they need to register, and what they need to do with respect to their suppliers, uh, in order to make sure that um, that they are also registered. Uh, that letter, I think, went out about um, over a week ago, uh, maybe ten days ago. So I would point, if you're having trouble with your haulier, I would point them to that letter from Lord Agnew, um, which explains, you know, exactly what they need to do. Uh, and points out to them that there is actually, as we pointed out in the slide, there is a lot of stuff that the haulier has to do. They can't simply uh, not do anything. Okay, we'll, we'll try to dig out that letter if, or if someone could send it to us, it would be great as well. And we'll share that letter alongside the, si the slides when they're signed off and the, the recording as well. Shankar, thanks for your time, Frank. If you've got just another couple of minutes, that would, yeah. be, would be great. 
Uh, there's a few questions in here about defining whether they need to engage with SPS processes. I'm assuming the answer there is if you have not done already to go speak to the DERA department, the, the local agriculture and rural affairs department. Yes, definitely. Yeah. Yeah. The, um, yeah, the SPS, I mean, the SPS is, is complex um, and there is a number of criteria depending on the type of products. Um, so specialist advice, if you haven't done it before, is, is, is something you should seek as well. Um, and again, some, some clear planning ahead of the end of the year, because you may need things like veterinary checks and health certificates to be issued as part, depending on what the products are. Sure. And, and then a number of questions around what's, what's regarded as at risk. And again, this is one of those things that we're, we're waiting on mm -hmm. some agreement between the UK and the EU at the Specialised Joint Committee uh, yeah. to, to give a definition to what's at risk. Is that correct? That's right. Yes. And we're, we're, we're waiting on clarifi clarification on that process so that we can we can look after that as well. But ideally, if, you know, the, depending on what comes out, it, it's what you can do ahead of that time is just think about what what evidences you may be able to produce or, or keep. Uh, that demonstrate that the goods have stayed in Northern Ireland. So if it's being delivered to a store, maybe it's a store inventory. Um, you know, if, it, if it's being sold locally, maybe it's some sales uh, inventories, etc. And there, there's a couple of questions here, a lot of questions in and around transit. People are getting stuff mm -hmm. from continental Europe. It's bouncing through the GB land, uh, the, the GB land bridge, and yep. indeed potentially through the Dublin to Northern Ireland land bridge. Mm -hmm as well I, I think there's some very helpful kind of transit or customer journeys there uh, yeah. in your slides but uh, i think we need to extend these a little bit maybe perhaps with, yeah. with some of this feedback here uh, which maybe look at it uh, for your next presentation i am conscious that we've gone significantly over time we're still 31 <laughs> questions unanswered on the screen i'm not going to get to those today uh, but as i as i mentioned we've taken a recording of this we're going to share the presentations we will provide answers to all of those still 31 unanswered questions that we have. This is an enormously complex uh, area for people who haven't been used to doing this type of administration before. Great. Stephen, we can't hear you. in the mic can you hear me now yep. yes uh, so frank we're going to leave it here now we'll we'll follow up with the recordings the presentation and some of those answers with your support as well uh, but Definitely. i'll ask you if there was a couple of very simple steps that people should take now in this next week what would your recommendation be for those it's it's these it is in the supply chain still um so please look at your supply chain make sure that um Organizations in your supply chain understand their responsibility in the process and that they have registered if you're going to use the TSS. That's really critical. Great stuff. Frank, thanks very much for your time, Shankar okay. and, and Kevin, who's, who've left us already. Yeah. Uh, more information to come. Uh, a lot of these systems and processes are still being designed out in your one critical cog and yeah. many wheels that, that we need to uh, ensure that trade can continue to smooth, smoothly flow between GB and NI in particular. Uh, apologies, we didn't get to everybody's questions. We're now sitting at 32, so we better finish before we get any more. Uh, but uh, we will be back out with the presentations, a recording of this and those answers as soon as possible. Thanks very much for joining us all. Thank you.